you know, you could probably judge the health of a of a one of those companies by you know going into it and seeing whether people are, are laughing in meetings, they're laughing with each other. Because I just think if that's not happening, then then there probably is you know a, some problem with the culture. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a writer, director and producer for award-winning series and scintillating stories on the silver screen. His hit sitcom series, Drop the Dead Donkey, which he co-wrote and produced with Andy Hamilton, won a BAFTA for Best Comedy Series as well as a British Comedy Award. He continued his sitcom success with his second award-winning series, Outnumbered, which ran for five series and a special on BBC One. He then carried his comedic career to the silver screen with the award-winning film What We Did on Our Holiday, starring David Tennant, Rosamund Pike and Billy Connolly. However, comedy is not his only quality, having written and directed the romantic drama The Sleeping Dictionary, starring Hugh Dancy and Jessica Alba. His work on the screen shimmers with sophisticated silliness that leaves audiences in stitches whilst exploring the important issues of family, politics, love and life. Guy Jenkin, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's an absolute great pleasure to have you here and what a career you've had. But I'd like to go back to the start. Uh, the Jesuits say, give me a child of seven and I will give you the man. How was the young seven-year-old Guy Jenkins? Was he comedic? Was he funny? Was he inclined that way? Oh, I don't know. Um, well, we're starting with the Jesuits. That, that, is, uh, that is very high polluted. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I wanted to be a writer from quite an early age. I hadn't quite worked out what I wanted to write. Um, I, I suppose, you know, humour was always important in my family. So I, that it's probably sets you off in the right direction. Um, I, yeah, I, I, we didn't have a television till... Um, I was quite a bit older, so I wasn't I wasn't watching the sort of great comedies when I was very young. Uh, but I did. I, I probably my my comedy came from those children's books, you know, those very traditional ones like Just William and, and things like that, which are, in fact, very funny. So was anybody in your family funny? Was I mean, was funny valued? Um, well, I don't know. They. Nobody was, you know, uh, nobody was a comedian, nobody, but I think the, that my, my, you know, my family valued humour um, as, a, as a way of expressing ourselves. And I think always with families, it, you know, the best moments that you remember are when, when everyone has a laugh about something, often something that would never, would never translate to the screen because it's so silly or so personal. Um, you know, those sort of running jokes in families that, that, that make no sense to outsiders, but uh, are a kind of, but kind of unite the family. So um, I think there was always that. And was it always very verbal humour, I don't think, was it, uh, or, or was it silly humour? What, what, what do you remember? I, I mean, we weren't, you know, we weren't a sort of, wise cracking family at all um you know quite i think probably quite 
serious in most of the time in 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 some ways I mean I was an only child so um I didn't have that outlet of a, a brother or sister who, where we could where we could share humor um so I think it was more when when I got school friends who uh, and, and they're often it's it's what you laugh at that, that unites you absolutely well you You've built a very successful career using comedy. Do you think that you can be a truly good communicator without understanding humour? Can you be a good communicator without understanding humour? Um, I suppose it's possible. Um, you know, some people are, are excellent communicators and aren't funny, um, but it's, it probably limits. If, if you're a communicator, like a, a politician or somebody who's just giving a message, then I don't suppose you need it. But I think if at a personal level, if you're in work, if you're, if you're trying to, to communicate with people around you, then I think you certainly lose a lot if you don't have humour. I would say, and, uh, and, and, maybe you would agree or not, I don't know, that the difference between uh, a good speaker or a good communicator and a great speaker is that essence of humour. Would you agree with that? I think it, I think it certainly elevates anybody, anybody as a speaker. Um, you know, it's sort of even in, well, I mean, in the world, in the world of politics, you know, a lot of the things that are remembered are not the and not the sort of great phrases, but the, uh, the, the wit of politicians, you know, Calvin Coolidge is dead, how do they tell? And, <laughs> or, you know, um, or, or, or just the insults, to be quite honest, but, but um, yeah, I think, I, think you, I think you lose something if you, if you have that sense of humour as a communicator. What? Yeah, I, I think we've had uh, Alistair Campbell on the podcast and we've also had William Haig. And Alistair Campbell said that actually the only thing that really scared Tony Blair was William Haig's humour at um, uh, Prime Minister's questions because he could cut into the quip uh, with his humour. And so that was the thing that elevated um, William Haig. Having said that, he didn't he didn't win power ultimately, did he? So. <laughs> well, I think the the jokes definitely lost at that point. I mean, yeah, I don't ever remember Tony Blair being funny. He was certainly very earnest, um, but yeah, that's clearly a, a, a case of where it didn't work. But but talking about politics, um, and we won't go into anybody's politics, but we do have a prime minister at the moment in Boris Johnson who seems to be boosted by uh, being perceived, at least, as humorous and not serious. And, and do you think that's as a result of people being sort of like fed up with um, uh, humor being taken out of politics? Possibly. I mean, there is that, there now is that, that desire for supposed authenticity, um, which often, I think is extremely uh, manicured and, and well-prepared uh, authenticity. Uh, yeah, if you can fake that, you can get away with anything. If you can fake authenticity, then, then <laughs> you've got a long career in, in, in politics there, haven't you? Yes, it does. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, and if you compare him to, to May before him, who certainly um, showed no signs of having a, any sense of humour and seemed, you know, as you said about um, Tony Blair, seemed kind of scared by humour, um, didn't know what to do. Uh, so maybe it is a reaction against those kind of politicians. What makes you laugh, Guy? Fleabag and this country and um, there she goes and virtually anybody falling over, always find that very funny. In life, I suppose it's just those moments with, with friends where a joke continues, you know, not sort of, it's not like a story or a, or a joke, but 
just something where somebody's funny and then somebody gets on board with that and it just keep rolling. I think those are often the moments that I, I look back on as having really, really enjoyed. Uh, yeah, there's something about sharing laughter with people you know really well, isn't there? That 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 you you, you can just say a word and it anchors you back to to the state of 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 fun and laughter. I think that's very true. Um, tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you. Well, um, you mentioned the, the the film, what we did on our holiday. Um, I mean, I arrived back in Glasgow where, um, um, on a sort of late night train and they um, got a mini cab for me. And I, uh, I was going to get in the back, but I got, ended up getting in the front of this, of this cab. Um, there was about an hour's drive to where we were filming. Um, and I, um, I almost instantly fell asleep. And then I was woken up by this noise and I realized it was the driver snoring that had, had woken me up. And we were just approaching a corner in this wooded road. So I kind of grabbed the wheel. We went around this corner. Um, this isn't really a funny story, is it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and um, yeah, so he shook himself awake, very apologetic. Um, and obviously we talked a great deal for the, I, I just fired questions at him nonstop for the remaining half hour of the, of the drive. I mean, what was very strange was that Andy Hamilton and I had, had written in, in the film already a scene where um, everybody in the family falls asleep and the little girl who's sitting in the front of the car has taken the steering wheel and is, is the only one awake steering them down a motorway. So rather than, than copying real life, um, real life, real life copied the film. But oh um, my word, that uh, is that uh, tragedy plus time equals comedy. There really isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, that is true. Well, near tragedy certainly. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. Gosh, um, what did it say? Well, I mean. Did the guy recognise that he'd fallen asleep? Yeah, yeah, no, he, he was he was very thankful. I think to, you know that. I mean, if I got in the back, I don't know what would have happened, and uh, and if he hadn't snored, I don't know what would have happened. It certainly certainly the moment of being awoken by somebody snoring is is uh, very memorable. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Gosh, there was, there was actually there was another moment on that film, which was. Uh, it sounds like a nightmare. It was one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. Um, it, it, it was it was wonderful. But uh, we'd hired a um, helicopter to just do a day's worth of, of um, filming in the north of Scotland. And we'd got various units in different places um, ready to um, ready to roll when the helicopter arrived. And so Myself and the first AD um, arrived to meet the helicopter. Um, and there was a guy with a Russian accent who was a pilot who came out of the helicopter and his first words to us were, was, we are so fucked. Um, and then the cameraman, the weather it was so bad, the thunderstorms, and the cameraman came out and his hand was shaking visibly as he shook hands with us and we thought afterwards they must have been they must have been so struck by by lightning on the way over or something because clearly clearly something had happened but um from from then on sort of then going up in this helicopter they said well we'll just do a little bit um the the first ad told someone to say goodbye to his wife um and uh, <laughs> Uh, and we went round with this guy who, who was clearly completely um, psyched by, by something. The other words I remember from him is, we are flying over the sea. We have no life jackets. This is so illegal. <laughs> so and I you still got in the helicopter? <laughs> well, 
oh, people will meet you, you know. <laughs> but I, again, I make this, this this film sound like it was some sort of uh, nightmare near near death experience, where most of it was just sitting on a beach waiting for the, you know, waiting to get ready with Billy Connolly telling us wonderful stories. So in fact, as I say, it was, and and the three young children in it who were who were lovely and so it, it was um it was actually a, a you know a very good experience well I, i'm i'm fascinated because you've worked so much with um young children you've had so much success um i mean i'm thinking particularly of outnumbered and obviously the film um the children don't have life experiences of the adults and different perspectives etc how can children be funny without resorting to just telling grown-up jokes? Um, and what lessons can we learn from the humour of children? Is it simpler, more honest, more direct? Well, I know Samantha Bond, who played the auntie in, in Outnumbered, um, was acting with um, Ramona Marquez, who plays the, the, the little girl in that. Um, and she said, sort of, well, that this is what she doing, what 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 Ramona is doing is is true acting because she is just being absolutely in the moment, which is what all other actors aspire to. I mean, it, you know, it varies according to the age of the children, how conscious they are of of what they're doing. I think, but um, when they are when they when they're younger, I think. It's well, and, and, and you know, partly we didn't get them to ever get them to learn lines in advance and things like that. So they're just really just being themselves. You know, in some ways, filming was the least exciting part of their day. You know, they they go off upstairs and and um, well, they had a very where well, they had a sort of tutor who who made it great fun, and and then they'd just be interrupted every now and again by you know somebody annoyingly coming them telling them they had to go downstairs and and and, and film for 45 minutes so um i think it is just them them genuinely being themselves and but how do you set that up in 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 terms of i mean presumably it's it's largely about the casting and getting the right uh, children in place I mean with uh, I mean I used to guest with the comedy store players and like with improvising that's a game and everyone's trained to follow the lead but how does it work when something is partly scripted and partly improvised I think it's partly that you create a situation um, where the, you sort of take away all the um, all the sort of things that are annoying about filming to, to children. No makeup. We didn't have a first, you know, who's sort of shouting action. We just had the cameras rolling when they came on to when they came on to set. Um, we didn't tell them to stand anywhere in particular. Um, we had a great lighting director who just light an area so they could just wander around uh, and just be themselves. Um, and of course, it also takes very, you know, actors who are, well, both very skilled and very generous playing with them. Um, in that the Claire and Hugh in Outnumbered, um, you know, they they would uh, the, the the first um, the first setup would always be two cameras on the children or. or camera on the, the, the child and them and on the child um, and where they would just be kind of encouraging the child to to um, to say what they felt comfortable you know to to get the, the lines we needed out but or, or just to sort of run off in some direction if that if that worked and then because of the children's hours they then had the the hell of doing their half with Andy or me squatting down in a cramped position, doing an impersonation of a of a four year old or a six year old. Um, so um, you know, they they must take a lot of credit for that. I think. 
Oh, no. Well, I mean, it was just fabulous. And, and it's lovely to hear about how, but you actually have to allow them to play because the, the connection with humorology is kind of like, the, say, an executive uh, tells a joke and expects a certain response that doesn't get that response. Where does she, he go with that? Is there a way to plan for that so our listeners can sort of take something away from it? A friend of mine um, was in a very recently was um, in a marketing meeting with um, a Zoom meeting with with um, Amazon, uh, and there were about fifty people literally in the, on the Amazon side of it. Um, so his opening remark was, uh, "So who's delivering all the parcels today?" Um, <laughs> which I find very funny, but apparently went down like a lead balloon. So obviously you have to you have to choose your audience for the for the ice breaking comment that would, it would have worked on me. I don't know. It it it's generally good to be able to be funny, except you just occasionally come up with against people who who at least in that situation don't have a don't have a sense of humour. Yeah, you work in a very creative medium, um, and I think you know, most companies need to be creative. Most people in whatever they're doing need to be creative. How important is a sense of play in creativity? Um, I think that is very important. Um, you know, you could probably judge the health of, a, of a, one of those companies by, you know, going into it and seeing whether people are, are laughing in meetings or laughing with each other. Because I just think if that's not happening, then then there probably is, you know, a, some problem with the culture. Um, so, and, and, yeah, just sort of feeling unfettered when you're, uh, you know, working towards an idea or being able to go off on some tangent that is funny and then actually may lead somewhere. Uh, I think, and it also just makes people want to come into work much more, I think. So, uh, no, I, I, I agree that. I think that really is very important. Is everyone potentially funny or are there some people who just, because you just mentioned that, you know, that people didn't get that joke and got offended or whatever, and you go, is there a potential or is it a, a gift given to the few? I don't think the few. I mean, you do find people who just don't have a sense of humour, um, which makes it very difficult, I think. You know, um, you just see, you know, occasionally Rio around a table or something, you'll see everybody laughing and you just see somebody kind of staring, thinking, why is that funny? Uh, well, yeah, I, I suppose it's good, but I think they, I mean, in terms, I think if you're not funny, I think you have to learn how to be a good audience because then um, you are part of that. Well, I suppose it depends if, you, if you're not, I mean, a lot of people aren't funny, but if you don't find anything funny, then you can't even be a good audience. So I think that that is tricky, but... I suppose kind of like-minded people tend to gather together. So, um, you know, hopefully in, in, in workplaces, then there is a sort of, I don't know, I think they often take their, their quality from whoever the, if, you know, if there's one person in charge, they often set that tone. You know, if that person can be funny and relaxed, then it kind of, I mean, it allows uh, the, the business to be like that. And probably also people sort of hire, hire people who are a bit like them. So I think you get these, these companies where there's a very positive culture of, of, of comedy. I mean, certainly Hattrick, where I do the majority of my work, is, is, is very like that. Is, is that set by the leaders? Obviously, I know Jimmy Mulville, who runs Hattrick, and you uh, that work with uh, Jimmy and you also, you know, work with Andy Hamilton. Are you setting the tone for everything on sets and in meetings and everything? And, and does, is, is leadership important in creating that tone? 
Well, the hat trick, it's, it's Jimmy, because, you know, we've got an office there, but we're not officially part of hat trick in any way. Um, so I think that tone comes very much from him. Um, you know, and the other kind of senior leaders there. Um, but yeah, I think on, I think on set, it certainly, it certainly helps. Um, I suppose you've got to kind of know, uh, it, it depends a bit on the, the actors that you're working with. Um, you know, sometimes people, there are those actors who just really want to get into a zone before they act, particularly if it's a more serious scene, and then you don't want to break that. But, but generally, the point where you and someone can have a laugh about something is the point where you, you kind of create a relationship and, and it, it moves on from there. I just think, I, I, just think I, I remember that you and I um, both knew William G. Stewart and I remember uh, when I was very young going on sets with him. In fact, I went on Frost Live from London and I was there in the afternoon and I was like a sort of sort of, you know, 16 years old. And I was I went, Bill, you you know, everybody's name. And he looked at me and he went, Paul, that's the job. The job is to know everybody's name and keep everybody happy. That's what a producer should be doing. And I remember that every, he literally, the sparks would walk by and, and he'd go, all right, Sammy, how are you doing? And then everything, all right, Billy boy, you know, and they'd have banter and they would do that. But there was a purpose to it because especially in those days, as you remember, that it was very highly unionized. Yeah. And, and if you needed two more shots at the end of the day, if you hadn't got the crew on side, they literally would just pull the plug and walk off. Whereas he, he had a, a rapport with everybody. And so when he needed anything, you know, he'd go up to Sammy and say, Sammy, we need uh, an extra half an hour for the boys. I'll see them right in the bar. And Sammy yeah. would go around and talk to everybody. So, I mean, is that... I mean, for our listeners to take away, to create an atmosphere so that when something does go wrong, you have you have a connection through humour. Um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, I mean, that simple thing, like knowing everybody's name is, is really important. And, um, you know, I, I uh, William G. Stewart um, was a producer and director on a couple of early things that... that um, that I wrote, and and so you know, he's one of those people that you you learn that from. Um, but I mean, you know, apart from the the practical benefits, it's also just a much nicer working atmosphere if you if you know who people are and 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 can can talk to everybody. I think on set, also that it kind of divides between those people who are in charge who think that gives them an entitlement and those in charge who thinks it makes them have a sort of duty um, and things work much better with the latter people. And you find that with leading actors as well. Um, you know, there are people who, who you know, uh, feel that um, because they're the lead in something, um, they, they, will, they have a sort of responsibility to, to set a tone, to know people, to, uh, you know, have everybody around the pub afterwards. And they're, you know, they're obviously a magnificent asset to a, to a production. Um, I think, I think in some cases it, it, it comes from people who were um, actors who were sort of touring in, in stage productions for a long time, because I think there, they're that culture, um, Generally, I'm sure there are exceptions, but generally that the, the 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 stars, I think, were expected to sort of set set the tone there. Given the uh, that you've got so many actors you can choose from, and you know, in in business there are so many people we can choose from. Surely you are always going to make a choice of somebody who creates that brilliant atmosphere you've got two great actors you're going to choose the one 
who creates the, the best atmosphere on set, aren't you? Well, that's, that's very important, I think. I think that, that there is sometimes a misunderstanding about sort of genius, that to be a genius, you've got to be a complete bastard, you know, um, and, you know, you've got to be troubled and therefore annoying. And for every, you know, great actor who is like that, there are several others who are equally talented, but a great pleasure to work with. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a kind of, on on casting lists, many people have a have a sort of um, a sort of code of LTS that goes against some names, which is life's too short. Um, so there are um, there are actors who you just get warned off. A very small minority, a, a, very, a very small minority. I mean, I've, I've I don't think I've ever worked with anybody who's been a pain in the ass. Um, and um you know generally it's just uh, you know it, it is a it is a pleasure um but I, I i think that definitely uh that that notion that that to be good you have to be difficult is is um is very wrong i i, I work with somebody who would a move from being a um, a personal assistant in Hollywood to working in post production in sound, um, and they said the final straw was they were a personal assistant to a big Hollywood um, actor, and he asked for a um, a glass of iced water, and they brought it to him, and he said, "No, I want it without condensation." Um, <laughs> And they thought, yeah, well, I can bring water, but I can't reverse the laws of physics here. Um, and I think that had just been the thing that sort of pushed them over. Tip the balance in everything. I can't work with this. There is condensation on my glass. Who do I yeah. see? Who do you have to fuck in this town to get no condensation in your ice water? God. <laughs> that's brilliant I don't know, I it's very spinal tap isn't it, it you know is. the scene yeah. in yeah. spinal tap in the dressing room where uh, he has the big piece of meat and the small bread and he's going i can't work with this i can't work with this but i'll rise above it because i'm a professional yeah well I, I, i'll tell you one more story that was told to me um from the set of a, a, a big epic um, film in um, that was filming in Britain, um, where they had their sort of biggest day. They had they had two thousand supporting artists waiting to go. They had special effects, and then the the leading actor was quite slow coming on the set. And then eventually he arrived, but he arrived with his guitar and said. Before we go, I'd like to play some songs to this to this audience. So he started. He started. He gathered all the all all the crew and cast around him, and was playing Bob Dylan songs um, at you know I mean costs of tens of thousands of pounds per hour. It must be some kind of power play, must it? It must be a, a, a sort of I can do this, but. But those are the people you don't want to work with. Yeah. Well, it, it is. I mean, psychologically speaking, that is just a power play, isn't it? I've got an audience and I'm going to do, and I'm going to hold everybody else up. Um, when I, I started off in the business um, by doing walk-ons and extras and uh, I, I worked just to get experience and get the money when I was uh, very young. And I soon worked out that the most important person on the set wasn't always the person you thought it was. It wasn't always the producer and it wasn't all the thing. Because if you'd pissed off, I remember sitting in makeup once on the last days of Pompeii with, uh, where I played Ernest Borgnine's slave. And I'm sitting there <laughs> 
And the, the, the second AD ran into the truck where we were being made up and went, hurry up, hurry up, we're going to think. And as soon as he closed the door, the makeup people put their, the, their stuff down and went, who wants a cup of tea? <laughs> Deliberately to do it because they'd been, you know, the power play had gone the wrong way. So you have to be very careful on that, uh, uh, playing those games, because otherwise they will trip you up. Um, so I, I love the um, LTS comment of a life's too short, uh, which leads me to what would the world be like without humour? Considerably more miserable than it is already, probably. Um, sorry, that sounds very bleak. Um, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. We wouldn't know about it, so we wouldn't miss it, I suppose. <laughs> well, yeah. Then, I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be out of a job for a start. <laughs> well, that, that that is quite bleak. Do you find yourself funny, Guy? I find what I write funny. Um, I do, before lockdown, I did tend to uh, write in cafes. Uh, partly because I just kind of like being out in the world, but I think also because you can't, once you're there, you can't go and divert yourself by turning on the telly or going off and doing some gardening or something. Um, but I do, I realise occasionally um, if I've written something that I find funny, laugh to myself. So, but then I realise I must be that, that man in the corner of the cafe sitting there scribbling and occasionally chuckling, whether nobody else was there. Um, <laughs> probably also occasionally kind of mouthing the lines I was writing. So um, I'm sure the, uh, the other people there must have thought there was someone with mental health issues in the corner. Um, care in the community. Care in the community. Well, yeah, I suppose, it, yes. Um, I noticed they sometimes started giving me free coffee, so they obviously felt sorry for them. <laughs> the poor old codger. <laughs> so it's working, but it, but you've just told yes. a, you've just told a, 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 an anecdote which is laughing at yourself. Um, so how important do you think it is? Well, for good mental health, for for, for resilience, so, and to laugh at yourself. You don't want to be the only one not laughing at you, do you? It's um, <laughs> Um, well, no, clearly it is, it is very important um, to be able to do that, uh, particularly if you have children, I find, because they, if they, if you, if you don't, they certainly will. <laughs> they certainly will, Guy. I can... <laughs> They're very, very healthy in that respect. They kind of, you know, at keeping keeping you centred, as they would say now. Well, yeah, or taking you down off your imagined pedestal. It's, it, yeah. it's, it's yeah. strange how they can do that. So if I asked you to write a business case for humour, what would you include in it? A business case for humour? Uh, well, at its simplest, I think that an office where there's a lot of humour, everybody's happier and people who are happier probably work better. So I think, I think I would boil it down to that. I mean, there's obviously other things, but I think that that's, uh, that's probably the most important thing. I think it, it is the most important thing. And, and you've just expressed the return on investment, which is, people are going to work better when they're happier and they, they're going to be more willing to, to actually, you know, do things for you uh, when they do that. So I think it's a, it's a great thing. And what else is a return on investment for keeping, just thinking in terms of a set, what's your return on investment for keeping a good atmosphere and, and humour at the forefront? Well, people people work better, you know, um, if, if people are just sort of trudging through the day, then 
you know, you'll make mistakes. You'll, um, you know, actors, you know, it's tough kind of pulling yourself up to give a performance um, on cue, you know, six days a week, 10 hours a day. So, um, I mean, you know, humour can't do that alone. Certainly, if it's if it's somewhere that you um, can have a laugh and and uh, look forward to going into um, in in the mornings, then then it's going to make a difference. So you think there's a correlation between the if if you if the set is miserable or if the office is miserable, that actually it has a knock on effect to. Um, how things get done, how quickly, how efficiently things get done. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we know ourselves. We're, we're going to do a much better job if we're, if we're feeling cheerful that day or cheerful about it than, um, than if we're not, you know. Filling in paperwork, it's very hard to feel, very hard to feel cheerful about. Whereas if you're doing something that you're sort of vaguely enjoy, then that's going to work better. Have you ever taken a joke too far or crossed the line? I'm sure I must have. Um, you just don't want to admit it, do you? Well, well, I, I probably I, I did do something once that that um, certainly probably did no didn't really help um, some of the relationships I was in. Um, when I was, I think I was 29, I was working for Spitting Image. Um, and um, they had a sort of, they, they got rid of the older writers. At 29, I was an older writer. Uh, I mean, God knows what I am now. I've been, that was the first time I was over the hill. I've kind of come crawling stubbornly back many times from then. But they wanted younger writers. There was a shortage of, of female writers. And so those were the days when you just sort of posted material off. So a 14-year-old schoolgirl called Sarah Yellop started posting material in. Um, and that was me. Um, so, and she did very, very well. Um, one of the, the, somebody wrote in the New Musical Express, it's a sad reflection on the tired old British comedy writers that the best sketch this week was written by a 14 year old schoolgirl. She got her own credit one week, she was, she was doing brilliantly. Um, uh, but I, I eventually, I, I told them. Um, and I don't, I don't think that probably, certainly temporarily anyway, that, that, that didn't, that didn't help my relationship with a, with a, with a few people. Um, because they felt that you, 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 they'd been conned, basically. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to them, I suppose it showed that their, um, that their sort of vetting of, of material sent in was very good. Um, so, you know, um, probably impersonating a 14-year-old female now would be frowned upon, but it was... It, I think what that proves is, is that people, um, you know, when you're looking for something, you find it. So, you know, they were, look, they were, looking, they were looking for this, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably why a lot of scientific experiments have gone wrong, because you're looking for something and you find a way of finding it. So. Yes, you, you, you think, well, it's funny because um, Ronnie Barker used to uh, have a... a pen name didn't he that uh, he used to write in as uh, I can't remember the name he had but Gerald Gerald Wiley? something yes I think, I think it was I think it was something like that anyway and uh, but he did it so it, he wouldn't be judged on on, on those yeah, terms yeah. in business is it survival of the fittest or survival of the funniest I, I know you want me to say the funniest but I don't actually. I don't. Oh, think, oh well. I don't uh, care. No, I mean, is are Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos known for their fantastic senses of humour or their killer instinct? I, I yeah, I know. I, I 
you know, I, I, we've spoken about how it's very important to, to sort of set a tone, but um, I, I suspect that the, the, the killer in businessmen is probably, is probably more effective in the long run than the, the funny. Yeah, I, I, I think it depends, doesn't it, on the circumstances somewhat, but I think ultimately you're right, the killer is going to win out, uh, which, which upsets me slightly from a humorology uh, perspective. Well, maybe, maybe Jeff Bezos is actually, you know, in, 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 in real life is, is just killingly funny and we just don't know that. Well, uh, you're never going to find out now you've pissed off those people from Amazon. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> you told the story. <laughs> oh, OK. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, no, you're joking. We now come to the part of our show, Guy, called Quick Fire Questions. Quick Fire Questions! Who's the funniest business person you've met? Now, obviously, you work in the television business, so it can be that business or it can be um, any any person you've met who's not a comedian. Not a comedian? Oh, well, that's, uh, that was going to be my answer. Um, oh, well, go on then. Well, you can be a comedian then. No, I mean, I was just going to say Billy Connolly because, I mean, I'd always hugely admired him as a comedian um and then in person he was just uh, a great teller of stories you know he would he would tell you this story and he'd have you kind of roaring and then you go back and tell it to somebody else and they go yeah that's quite funny and so you realize it was him uh so as a kind of because i you know as a sort of acid as an acid test, I think that was, uh, um, you know, like a scientific experiment that proves that he's, he's fantastically funny. Well, uh, genius is a word that's too often bandied around, but we are talking real genius when we think, because his ability to A, tell stories, but tell them where, and bring them to life. And, and he has that, extraordinary knack of of make laughing it in and from a psychological perspective I would say what he's doing is there's a saying in psychology that if you want anybody to go into any state you have to go into that state first he goes into such a state of fun that you enter that state with him and get carried along with it is is that what you're saying about the way he is um, it, it may be that I, 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 you know, I don't think I'm, I can't analyze what, what makes him funny, but he, I mean, I think that's an element of it, certainly. Yeah. And, and I mean, different comedians have, have different techniques, don't they? You know, there are those, those who, who carry you along with them. Uh, and there's those who are sort of, sort of funnier than you who, who, who uh, you know, um, work that way. But um, no, I, I think you're probably right. I think that probably is, 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 is a big element of it. What book makes you laugh? I, t I, I tell you what I'll pick. I'll, I'll pick Spike Milligan's World War II, um, well, autobiography, I suppose. Um, because I think he was a writer that could make you laugh out loud on the page, which not a huge number of, of, of writers can do, you know, even good ones, even funny ones. Um, but I also think that, that there are um, sort of, as a document about what World War II was like, about what being there you know, just as a sort of squad he was like. They're, they're a fantastic history resource that people should read um, because he just, he, he, he captures that. But he also is, as ever, killingly funny. There was, he is. He, I think the longest laugh I've ever heard was at the British Comedy Awards where they were giving him a lifetime award. I don't know if you, if you, if you know the moment. Um, 
and he he came up on stage and he looked quite um, sort of unwell and a little bit sort of shaky and and you sort of thought oh dear I hope he's you know I hope he's all right and uh, very pretentiously they got out a kind of roll of vellum and read out um, an accolade to him from Prince Charles and there was a pause and then he said groveling little shit and it was just I mean it, at that moment it was just sort of that perfect pricking of pomposity yes um, um it, uh, and I, I must have laughed for about five minutes it, it just just because of the I don't know uh, it was it was one of the relatively few funny moments at the British Comedy Awards <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the wonderful thing was there was that there was that sharp intake of breath, first of all, and then the room just exploded, didn't it? And, and it, it carried it really, on the laugh. It was very joyful, I thought, yeah, yeah. Because also yeah. it was that sense of, oh, he has still got it. Because he it, it is almost a fear that it's going to be one of those embarrassing moments, you know, you give it to somebody too late there, there you know, and, and of course it wasn't. No. Oh, no, absolute genius again. What film makes you laugh, Guy? I'm sure it would be a completely different one on a different day. I think today I'm going to say Midnight Run. Um, Charles Grodin, um, De Niro. Uh, uh, it's, it's one of those sort of few films that, escapes genre it's like uh, uh, I mean it's obviously a, a very good comedy it's a brilliant it's sort of character based comedy of this odd couple but also a bit of a thriller you know there's gunfights there's um, uh, there's a sort of serious undertone to it but it, it certainly it doesn't pale with um, with watching it many times um his girl friday i would say on another day it must have a script that's about four times as long as most modern scripts because it just the dialogue just crackles along at fantastic speed and they never stop talking oh. but it's great. Well, midnight run you share with uh, ainsley harriet chose that on this show as well oh that's interesting there's, there's a yeah. kind of small group of people who when you say that to they say yes that's a that's a great film oh, yeah, well, yeah, if i ever yeah. if i ever meet ainsley harriet i'll have something to talk about with him well we all we all live pretty close to each other so i can arrange that whenever you like mm -hmm. uh, we'll have breakfast together um what's not funny going to the other side of things what is not funny well very little isn't funny I mean, you know, Chris Morris made one of those fake news shows um, about paedophilia that unsurprisingly got attacked by lots and lots of people who hadn't seen it. And I, I must say, I think I thought, how can that be funny? But because it was about the... Um, the reaction to it and the sort of overreaction of the press. And it it was funny. So, you know, it, it that anybody who hasn't seen it will probably be horrified. But no, you but, know. They, that, but they should look it up because um it was uh I think it was on Brass Eye, wasn't it? Brass Eye, it was a special edition of Brass Eye. Yeah, yeah. Brass Eye. And they, and it and it was also it was about um the the way the press dealt with, dealt with it, like you say, and it was it was heightening the awareness. And you're right, it it, it was funny, but it's an inappropriate thing supposedly for comedy, but it worked. So I mean, is there anything that makes you slightly uncomfortable in terms of comedy that that do you think, or do you think everything is fair game if it's in the right hands and it's done in the right way? I think it's usually tone that makes me uncomfortable in a in a comedy where somebody just seems to have uh, being 
funny, uh, not about something that you can't be funny about, but being funny about it in a way that makes you uncomfortable. What word makes you laugh? Oh, God. Um, a very well used, a very appropriate swear word can make me laugh. I think just on occasions, I mean, it's, it's overused, but if somebody picks it just right, if, if probably if there haven't been any, and then suddenly somebody comes out with one, then I think that, that is often very funny. What sound makes you laugh? Well, I do like slapstick, so I suppose the the sound of 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 people falling over in a funny way. I yeah, I would I would I would admit to that. I do have I do have a sort of weakness for those shows that collect um, you know video footage of, of things going wrong. Would you? I know that you um, have uh, you were educated at, at Cambridge. So would you rather be considered clever or funny? Probably funny. I mean, I suppose ideally you do want to be considered a bit of both because you want to have you want it to be sort of clever humour rather than you know toilet humour or. But uh, if, if you put a gun to my head, I'll 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 go funny. You do, but do you not think that most people you've met in your life who are funny are also clever? Don't do you have to be clever in order to be funny? It helps certainly. Yeah, I mean, there's people who are who are just have funny bones. I think who are who don't know why they're funny, but are funny and I suppose for that you don't need to be clever that's just a that's just a gift. So uh, well I, you see I, I'm intrigued by this because um, people I think have got funny bones would be people like um, Tommy Cooper or Eric Morecambe but I would say that they were clever because they understood you know the rhythm of uh, things that work. They, they understood that how important the physicality of it was. And it's just, it's just a different kind of clever, isn't it? Oh yeah, with them, I think that, that, that is the case. I suppose, but I'm thinking back more people you just, you come across or people you know, but I think, yeah, I think with them, yeah, they obviously are very clever in, 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 in working out how to use it. And finally, Guy, Desert Island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is it? Oh, I, 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 I shall tell this one in, in honour of Barry Cryer, who was someone else who was very nice to us when we were all sort of young writers and took us to drinking dens that were open in the afternoon. And, uh, but he knows, more, he knows more parrot jokes than most people know jokes. Um, so I should go for the very trad somebody walks into a pub um, a man walks into a pub with a hamster and a parrot and there's a piano in the pub and the hamster hops up onto the piano and starts to play and he's like Rachman it's magnificent and then the parrot flies over sits on top of the piano and is singing and, and the parrot like Pavarotti he's got an amazing voice brings the house down and afterwards, the publican comes up to the guy and says, um, look, I'll buy, I'll buy either of those animals off you. He said, well, you can have the, the parrot for 50 quid. And somebody who was watching said, you're mad. I mean, they're fantastically valuable. Why have you sold the, the parrot for, for 50 quid? And he says, uh, well, that's just a ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> it's... <laughs> Not the greatest joke in the world, but it came so, to mind. I... It's a great gag and a great way to finish um, with a great talent. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Guy Jenkin. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. 
This has been a Big Sky production.